Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello. Uh, with globalization, uh, we uh, tend to think that the economic aspects of globalization like, are exciting, whereas globalization is seen as posing a threat to culture. So initially, uh, when uh, there was talk about globalization in India, most uh, uh, corporates people in businesses were extremely excited about the opening up of, of the global markets and so the whole began to see the whole world as an expanding market. So there was a large scale, uh, there was uh, optimism as far as businesses and corporates were concerned, but uh, anxieties were large about globalization were largely voiced by the cultural guardians not only uh, in non-Western world like India, but also in the rest of the world, the concern was about the erosion of culture. But three, almost three decades down the line, we find that the economic and the cultural cannot really be separated from one another. And concerns about the economic uh, effects of globalization have increasingly uh, begin, begun to be voiced not only in the non-Western world or the developing world, but all across the world concerns about uh, globalization being, uh, as some had defined it right at the very beginning, as a form of global capitalism, as a, as a late stage of capitalism, which they dub late capitalism. So in this section, I would examine globalization as the rise of global capital capitalism, free market economy, largely um, after summarizing what the free market is, I would examine in detail Emmanuel Wallerstein's world system theory, which I did mention when we were trying to define globalization and show what what it means to live in the era of global capitalism, uh, how does the global, global capitalist system work, and, the, and conclude with concerns about the discontents of globalization, about how this integration of the world into capitalism, what it entails for people in different parts of the world. Uh, so, global capitalism or globalization as a late stage of capitalism entails the integration of the world into capitalism, which means the end of protectionism, a policy of free trade and the basis of which is an intrinsic belief in competition as healthy. So, the idea is that uh, with the increase in productivity and it will lead to increase in productivity and widening of consumer choices. I am going to give a very uh, basic kind of definition of free market ideology going back to Adam Smith's model and the idea that market forces, the profit motive drive the economy to efficient outcomes as if by an invisible hand. Now, modern economies show the sense in which and the conditions under which Smith's conclusion is correct. More recent advances in economic theory, ironically occurring precisely during the period of the most relentless pers pursuit of the Washington consensus policies have shown that A, whenever information is imperfect and markets incomplete which is to say always and especially in developing countries, then 
the invisible hand works most imperfectly. B. Significantly, there are desirable gammon interventions, which in principle can improve upon the efficiency of the market. And C. These restrictions on the conditions under which markets result in efficiency are important. Many of the key activities of Kamen can be understood as responses to the resulting market failures. In other words, the myth about the, uh, about the state, the nation state having become a non-player in the globalized economy is uh, demystified here because uh, as opposed to the idea that in a free market uh, there is no intervention by the government, uh, there are desirable government interventions uh, which are used to improve the efficiency of the market and to many of the key activities can be understood as responses to the resulting market failures. So, as um, the, the nation state uh, becomes an ally of global capitalism in several cases rather the, than opposing these forces and the nation state seems to be far from extinct. Let me now summarize Emmanuel Wallerstein's notion of the world system theory and his view that uh, globalization is not an entirely new process because he predates the history of globalization by locating it in the 16th century as I had mentioned in the first lecture while defining globalization. And Wallerstein considers it as the final stage in the movement of capital that began 500 years ago. He challenges classic, the classic definition of capitalism as a system based on the non-interference of the state in economic affairs. So, this, the, the, uh, the myth of the non-interference of the state in economic affairs is demystified by Wallerstein. He argues that it is based on the constant absorption of economic loss by political entities. So, this is important the constant absorption of economic loss by political entities while economic gain is distributed to private hands. And he stresses that capitalism as an economic mode is based on the fact that the economic factors operate within, within an arena larger than that which any political entity can control. So, that econo this idea that economic factors operate within an arena larger than that which any political entity can control leads us to the world system theory. Now, what is a world system? How does Wallerstein define his world system? World system according to Wallerstein is a social system, one that has boundaries, structures, member groups rules of legitimation and coherence. And world system is an organism in that it has a lifespan over which its characteristics change in some respects and remain stable in others. Therefore, it is a very self-contained system. So, a social system that has boundaries, structures, member groups, rules of legitimation and coherence and an organism that it has a lifespan span over which its characteristics change, in other words not static and it is self-contained. So, we need to understand what is a world system and we understand that by finding out what it is not. Most entities usually described as social systems, tribes, communities, nation states are not in fact total systems. Only real social systems are on the one hand those relatively small, highly autonomous subsistence economies not part of some regular tribute demanding system and on the other hand world systems. Re so, they are relatively large that is they are in common parlance worlds. 
Self-containment as an economic material entity is based on extensive division of labor and that they contain within them a multiplicity of cultures. So, let us let us un try to understand what uh, so to summarize world system as I have already said is a social system which has boundary structures member groups and is dynamic self contained it is not uh, uh, social systems what what we call social systems tribes communities nation states and uh, the real social systems are small highly autonomous subsistence economies not part of some regular tribute demanding system and on the other hand we have the world systems. So, world systems are relatively large and there is a self containment as an economic material entity which is based on extensive division of labor and they contain with them with within them a multi multiplicity of cultures. So, they are large units containing within them multiplicity of cultures. And there are two kinds of world systems. The first world system is world empires in which there is a single political system over most of the area however attenuated the degree of its self country control. And the second uh, world system is world economy in which such a single political system does not exist overall or virtually or all of the space. So, two kinds of world systems world empires and world economy. Now, what are world economies? Highly unstable structures which tended either to be converted into empires or to disintegrate. So, uh, world economies were highly unstable structures which, uh, which tended to be converted into empires or to disintegrate. According to Wallerstein, modern world system that a, wo that a world economy has survived for 500 years and yet has not come to be transformed into a world empire. So, the this 500 year old economy has not really converted has not transformed into a world empire a peculiarity that is the secret of its strength. What it does have is a multiplicity of political system. So, within this world economy the in the modern world which is the modern world system uh, we have a multiplicity of political systems and the size of a world economy is a function of the state of technology and in particular the possibilities of transport and communication within its bounds and the world economies have fluid boundaries. So, what are the important features of the world system? Let us try to look at them. The world system is first of all based on extensive division of labor and this division of labor is not merely functional. As we understand division of labor, it is not merely functional it is uh, or occupational, but division of labor which is geographical. The range of economic and the second part of this division of labor is that the range of economic tasks is not evenly distributed throughout the world system. So, there is an inequality, there is an imbalance in the distribution of uh, economic tasks. So, it is a and this is a function of the social organization of work one which magnifies and legitimizes the ability of some groups within the system to exploit the labor of others that is to receive a larger share of the surplus. So, this is important. It is a function of the social organization of work. So, in addition to the geographical division of labor, it is uh, also a function of the social organization of work one which magnifies and legitimizes the ability of some groups within the system to exploit the labor of others that is to receive a larger share of the surplus. And uh, culture within spatial location not occupation. Now, cultural homogenization tends to serve the interests of the key groups and pressures built up to create cultural national identities. But most important of all, 
uh, is that if there is to be a multitude of political entities, that is, if the system is not a world empire and a world economy and it has a multiplicity of political entities, then it cannot be the case that all the economy, all these entities be equally strong. They cannot be, for if they were, they would be in the position of blocking the effective operation of transnational economy, economic entities whose locus were in another state. So, we found out that this is uh, heavily loaded in favor of certain groups who feel entitled to the labor of others. So, it also cannot be that no state. So, on the, on, on the other hand, it ca cannot be that no state machinery is strong. For in such a case, the capitalist strata, sorry, capitalist strata would have no mechanisms to protect their interests, guaranteeing their property rights, assuring various monopolies, spreading losses among the larger population, etcetera. So, the world system, which is the world economy, has a multiple multitude of political entities and in this, all, uh, all are not equally strong, uh, because that would not allow the world, world economy to operate. On the other hand, it also cannot be that no state, state machinery is strong. So, uh, Wallstein uh, explains the role of the nation state, uh, which in, in the capitalist system, which, as, which is not um, that of non-interference as it is commonly believed to be, but interference in a certain sense. Uh, more so in the state of in the state of uh, nations where the state of in the case of nations where the state machinery is strong so the world's economy develops a pattern where state structures are relatively strong in core areas and relatively weak in the periphery so we have a multiple multitude of political systems some consisting of strong states and others of weak st states and a pattern in which state structures are relatively strong in the core areas and relatively weak in the periphery. We mean strength versus other states within the world economy, including other core states and strong vis-a-vis -vis local political units within the boundaries of the state. So, that brings us to the idea that state is not uh, not a neutral partner in capitalist economies, but it is complicit. Its complicity is um, based, it uh, consists of the creation of a strong state machinery coupled with the nation, national culture, a phenomena often referred to as integration that serves both as a mechanism to protect disparities that have arisen within the world system and as an ideological mask and justification for the maintenance of these disparities. So, two aspects in which with which the state becomes complicit within global capitalism or within free market capitalism is a the construction of a strong state machinery, the second is the production of a strong national culture, which uh, while the state machinery uh, protects disparities, uh, works as a mechanism to protect disparities that have arisen within the world system. The culture serves as an ide or ideological mask and justification for the maintenance of these disparities. So, we can think of the colonial state, which used the ideological mask of the civilization, civilizational mission to control the economies of their colonies. The most uh, well known uh, aspect of uh, Wallerstein's world system theory is the idea of core periphery and semi periphery, which has been borrowed in uh, economic uh, uh, theory and discourses to look at the division of the world, the geographical and economic division of the world. Though this uh, model of core semi periphery and periphery uh, is now considered redundant in view of the new configuration of the globe, 
global economy as well as global uh, political system, uh, it still seems to be relevant if we were if we were to carefully examine what Wallerstein is saying. So uh, the way uh, Wallerstein explains his model of the core, the semi periphery and periphery is in this manner. World economy involves a hierarchy of occupational tasks, which we said earlier that division of labor in the world economy is not merely occupational or uh, social, but it is geographical. And this is this involves a hierarchy of occupational tasks, in which tasks requiring higher levels of skill and greater capitalization are reserved for higher ranking areas. So, tasks requiring higher level of skills and greater capitalization are reserved for higher ranking areas. So, since the capitalist world economy essentially rewards accumulated capital, including human capital at a higher rate than raw labor power, the geographical maldistribution of these occupational skills involves a strong trend towards self maintenance. So, uh, as we see um, in the past as now that there is an skewed uh, distribution of occupational skills between uh, the core uh, parts of the world and the peripheries, because the, 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 the skills that are rewarded, which is capital uh, as opposed to raw labor are geographically maldistributed, because the core nations seem to control capital. In the absence of a central political mechanism for the world economy, makes it very difficult to intrude counteracting forces to the maldistribution of rewards. So, we, f we said at the, we found out right at the beginning that the world economy is not a world system, because it does not have a single political system, and there is not a single unit which controls the world economy. It has a multiplicity of po political systems. So, it is impossible to correct this imbalance or correct the maldistribution of rewards. Peripheral areas, Wallerstein says, I am quoting from him, I do not say peripheral states, not peripheral states, but peripheral areas, because one characteristic of a peripheral area is that the indigenous state is weak. As we found that in the multi multitude of systems, political systems, some states are bound to be intrinsically strong, whereas some states are relatively weak and these states are bound to be the states in the peripheries. So, one characteristic of a peripheral area is that the indigenous state is weak, ranging from its non-existence that is a colonial situation to one with a low degree of autonomy that is in a neo-colonial situation. And then we talk about he talks about the semi periphery. What are the semi periphery? Semi peripheral areas, not states, which are in between the core and the periphery on a series of dimension. Uh, what are these dimensions? The complexity of economic activities, strength of the state machinery, cultural integrity. So they are somewhere in between the core areas and the peripheral areas in terms of the economic, in terms of the complexity of like economic activities that they handle, the strength of the state machinery and cultural integrity and so on. Now, some of these areas had been core states of earlier versions of a given world economy. Some had been peripheral areas that were later promoted, so to speak, as a result of the changing geopolitics of an expanding world economy. Take the case of India. Now, India enjoyed a central position in the older world economy in terms of its uh, trade, not only with the Middle East, but parts of Africa and even uh, indirectly to Europe. The, the position it enjoyed up to a certain period before the colonization of India is an example of how these core 
areas of earlier versions of a given world economy now become peripheral areas, whereas peripheral areas become were promoted. Now, I, I, I would like to uh, conclude with another model. Um, uh, after uh, Wallerstein's model is critical of global, uh, while it defines the, uh, it's it's more of a de the elucidation of the world economy, the world system theory. It uh, it's critical, but uh, it merely describes the system. Uh, what is important in Wallerstein's model is that it doesn't, um, uh, even though we might critique the idea of the core, the periphery and the semi-periphery, Wallerstein has taken that into account by saying that uh, the, 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 the core periphery and semi-periphery can keep changing. So, it is a dynamic model, but the basic, the foundational concepts of Wallerstein's theory hold because the relationships between even though some uh, some some areas might have been uh, have grad might have graduated from periphery to core or from periphery to semi periphery or the former core areas might have changed to uh, periphery the relationships between the core the semi periphery and periphery still hold even if we look at the present global system and the the new world system, I mean the old world system as Wallerstein puts it, even in this late stage of capitalism, the relation between the core, periphery and semi periphery are, are replicated. Similarly, uh, more important is, e equally important is that it is, uh, the, the new phase of globalization is not a new process, it has been there and it is a completion, it is a consummation of that march of capital which has completely integrated or if to use a different metaphor sucked in the entire world into its, its uh, dagnet. Now, uh, the differences in the old uh, world, world system and the uh, earlier stages of the world system and the new stages of the world system are only in degree not in kind and that is why uh, the relationship between the periphery and the core remains the same uh, even though there are cosmetic differences. Take the example of uh, say uh, India as a source of raw material and labor in the in the colonial system where Indian workers began to be taken as indentured worker work, workers in the 19th century to the uh, plantation economies and um, uh, the, the so called coolies and the present uh, position of Indians, highly qualified Indians in the global economy where they still continue to service the global economies. We are not talking only about the migrant workers who work as um, the guest workers who work in different at low in low level positions in in the core core areas, but we are also talking about the more uh, qualified uh, professionals such as software professionals, uh, intellectuals, doctors and their position in with respect to uh, to uh, the core it remains the same because the core still re uh, remains the hub of capital and that is why someone has coined the term cyber kuhi to compare the position of the present software professionals migrating to the western world to that of coolies in the past. I conclude with um, uh, a more uh, dystopic narrative of globalization offered by Stiglitz in his book Globalization and its Discontents, a book which draws on his personal experience as chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under Bill Clinton from 1993 and chief economist at the World Bank from 1997. During this period, Stiglitz became disillusioned with the IMF, International Monetary Fund and other international institutions which he came to believe acted against the interests of impoverished developing countries. Stiglitz argues that the policies pursued by the IMF are based on neoliberal assumptions, 
that are fundamentally unsound. According to him, IMF interventions all followed a similar free market formula. The IMF strongly advocated shock therapy in a rush to market economies without first establishing institutions to protect the public and local commerce. Local social, political and economic considerations were largely ignored. Privatization without land reform or strong competitive policies resulted in crony capitalism, large businesses run by organized crime and a feudal social structure without a middle class. Uh, the next aspect is that there is no doubt that monetary aid lending could have had an important and effective role in advocating country efforts to sustain external shocks and improve economic state status. However, without strong forefront progress on the policy, the aid of balance of payments help could very well be counterproductive. The consequence will be escalated levels of debt weaken policy cre credibility and a lot more difficult task of adjustment in future. So, the IMF also foisted premature, premature capital market liberalization without institutional regulation of the financial sector. This destabilized destabil entire developing economies by causing massive inflows of hot sh short term investment capital, then when inflation rose. The IMF low conditions impose fiscal austerity and dramatically rising interest rates. This led to widespread bankruptcies without legal protection, massive unemployment without a social safety net and the prompt withdrawal of foreign capital. The few remaining solvent owners with zero opportunity for business growth stripped assets for any value they could. So, uh, we conclude by saying that this critique of the economic aspects of globalization uh, of global capitalism or late stage of uh, capitalism has uh, which was voiced by uh, certain um, discontents as we may call it within the third world or within the developing world at the onset of globalization have increasingly been voiced from within the west by at the right at the beginning by Wallerstein in his explanation of the world system and more lately by uh, people like uh, with books like globalization and its discontents. Thank you.